recognize you and thank you so much for your contribution to what we're doing. Thank you very much. And I saw uh, Bill Bensini, one of our county commissioners here. Bill, Bill, if you'd raise your hand and any other county commissioners that I may have missed who came in, if you would raise your hand and be recognized. Thank you. I also want to say a special thank you to Coy Willard. Many of you know Coy. He's uh, been around High Point all of his life. Um, he is uh, owner of the Wright Building downtown that many of you will remember. Uh, he has graciously uh, helped us with accommodations for the entire team uh, of Duwani uh, that's here and also the meeting place for all of our charrettes other than the opening meeting tonight and the one next week on Wednesday. So Coy, if you're here Raise your hand and let us recognize you. I know he was at a couple of our meetings today. Coy? Okay, well, give him a hand anyway. <laughs> um, I can't let tonight go by without saying a, a wonderful and heartfelt thank you to Wendy Fusco, our executive director for the City Project, and also to Richard Wood, our vice chairman. Uh, they have put countless of hours into this project, and we are so grateful for that. Richard and Wendy, thank you very much. And then last, but certainly not least, I have to uh, recognize and introduce to you as they stand up a group of nearly 100 investors who contributed anywhere from $25 to $125,000 accumulated into $410,000 to pay for this project. So all of our investors, would you please stand up? says an awful lot about our city, I think, and we thank you from the bottom of our heart. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes, uh, I'm going to turn the program over to Andreas Dewani. If you're like me, you probably have never heard of Andreas Dewani until he came to High Point. When we as a, a city project were thinking about how we could make a difference in this city with revitalization, we visited several communities like Greenville, South Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, and even Salisbury. And we determined very quickly that the first thing that each of those cities did that led to their success was to create a master plan. We started talking about that, and I want to give great credit to the person who introduced us to Andreas Dewani, and that is local architect Peter Freeman, who's right down here in the front. What you're going to find if you haven't read about him already is that Andreas Dewani is the most recognized person in the world for urban re revitalization. He has the title of the father of new urbanism. He's highly educated, he's highly motivated, and he's highly successful. He's done projects in over 300 cities across the world. So succinctly put, he is the best. He is absolutely the best in the business, and don't we deserve that here in High Point? We felt like that no matter what the cost, we needed to have the best because this is a very special city. So one thing I want to leave with you before I turn it over to Andreas is this. Recently, we heard um, some information that Councilman Jay Wagner shared with us at one of our board meetings, and it was from an article about revitalization. And it's pretty telling, and I want you to hear this. If a project like this doesn't work, it'll be another 20 years before it's tried again. Way beyond my life expectancy and probably many of you in this room. So it's very important that we make this a successful effort. And we have the best professional I know in the world to help us get there. I heard a, a great message last Friday night at High Point University's baccalaureate service from the speaker who talked about that famous passage from the book of Matthew about the city on the hill. 
And it reminded me of High Point. And it talks about shining the light across the world. And I am so encouraged by this crowd here tonight that I know that we're going to make that light shine so brightly that everyone will want to come to High Point to play, to work, and to have fun. And ladies and gentlemen, I know that you love this city just like I do. I know that your families are here. And I know that you deserve what we are trying to do. Our minister once told us that we should live what we believe. So if you believe that High Point can be the best place to raise your family and to have fun, then live what you believe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the finest architect and urban planner in the world, Andreas Dewani. Oh, Mr. Kleiner, now I have to adjust expectations downwards. <laughs> uh, this, those were beautiful words. Uh, this is a beautiful place. And uh, what I am uh, about to present is all about the reality. Uh, one of the things, I'm an architect, and one of the things that I love about urbanism is that it's uh, probably the most real thing that a designer can do. Um, it is a real test. If it doesn't work, you know it. Uh, it doesn't, it isn't just about taking the photograph and walking away and getting famous on an image that may not survive. Urbanism is really hard work and it has to do with, uh, actually one of the myths that I love is the myth of Sisyphus, you know, the fellow who had to uh, push the, he was condemned by the gods to push the boulder uphill. And one of the, there was, some 20 years ago or so, I was complaining about how I always found the boulder at the bottom of the hill. I would push it up and push it up and push it up, then go off, take a few days off, a few weeks off, and then I'd get a phone call and the boulder was at the bottom again, and I'd push it up. And I was telling my brother Douglas, who's in a similar business, and he said, you don't understand the myth of Sisyphus. All that Sisyphus had to do was stop insulting the gods. and then the punishment would stop. And what happens, the lesson of that great myth is that it is difficult to go against what, it is difficult to go against things that roll downhill, you know? And one of the things that I did for my life that made me enthusiastic is I knew that I had chosen my fate. That at any time that I wanted to do something easier, I could, I probably could. But it was so much more interesting to do very difficult things. And of course, what we've all been asked to do here, and it isn't just me, I have a very large team, including, including Peter, local people. I'm going to introduce you to Kennedy Smith here. There are lots of specialists that are required uh, to do this. Uh, we all love to do difficult things because we could all do, uh, we could all be merchandising strip shopping centers. We could all be doing office parks that are already permitted. There's nothing easier to do than suburban sprawl, but no, we choose to work with difficult, old, complex cities in which everybody has a say. And there's, some, there's hardly anything more difficult than that. And we love it. Now, something about your city. This is one of the most peculiar places I've seen. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's peculiar in so many different ways. And it's not exactly endearing the way you're peculiar, but it is terribly unique. And one of the things that I find is that when you go to American cities, they love to hear that they are unique. You know, we are unique. And they want to hear it from you, and I sometimes do that. That's an easy white lie. Yes, you're unique. But they're really not. There are very few unique cities in the United States. There are some exotic ones, some specialized ones, but most of the American cities are nice, sort of laid back old places that need a little help. This one, it really is uniquely different. And it is, um, and it is difficult to, uh, to explain to people who first see it because it looks normal, except for the fact that it's kind of shut down. And this is a, it looks like a normal university, except for the fact that it's kind of perfect. 
And, you know, when I look at this theater and I say, Lord, this is not your high school gymnasium. You know, I have to use bigger words. Isn't this theater one, didn't I see something like this in Versailles? You know, <laughs> and I'm pretty convinced I have. Um, so you have these slightly surreal situations. But there's one thing that's absolutely constant. Cities are absolutely organic. You know, they're not machines, they're organic. And they're either, at any time, they're either getting better or they're getting worse. They're getting better, they're not stable at all. And uh, yours may be going through a relatively good period. One cannot say that this city has gotten worse or is getting worse. I think as soon as I probe a little bit, I hear that, oh, this would never have happened. This is, you know, this is a city that's generally getting better. And so it's very odd to come in and be asked. Normally, I'm a kind of emergency room doctor. You know, that's what it feels like. It is so obviously taking a dive that finally we have to get a doctor, you know, to, to get on the case. And it's an emergency room. This is not in any kind of emergency. It just wants to get better. Something happened. Somebody had some kind of idea in the morning, and it spread like wildfire, that you want it to get better. But there is no crisis. There is no crisis at the moment. I think there's a feeling that there are opportunities here that actually you could tap into. And I think that's what it is. So nothing that I'm saying is that kind of thing. It's an emergency. It's all about making the city better. And that's also a little strange. As I said, I'm usually working in, uh, in crisis situations. Um, I don't know what would happen if you, you don't follow up on this plan. I don't know whether it would be exactly 20 years. I do think you have an easy glide. Uh, you have a couple of things going. You have a wonderful reputation worldwide. When you say high point, and obviously I've tested this for the last two months, people know what high point is more or less. You have an extraordinary uh, furniture market that is absolutely world renowned, that makes this place cosmopolitan for two weeks a year, and most importantly, it pays a huge amount of taxes. It pays an enormous amount of taxes, and by the way, it uses very little of those taxes. Unlike regular humans like yourselves who pay taxes and then consume services, they don't consume hardly anything. You could hardly have a better business if you were bookkeepers. Now, every once in a while, somebody wants to steal this wonderful business from you, and you have bravely, over the years, last 10, 20, or 30 years, you've fought back, and you've saved your furniture mart from this or that thief, most recently, Las Vegas. Okay, so good for you. You know, uh, you're awake. Obviously, this is a place that's awake. Another thing I have to say is I have been to city clubs, or so-called city clubs before, like your, I think it's called the Thread and... Splinter? <laughs> string and splinter. The string and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, I've been there three or four times already, and it's full of people. It's full of people listening to each other and wanting to do the right thing. I've spoken there twice, and actually the reception was absolutely first rate. There's a huge contrast between, I would say, the civic aspiration and then walking outside and seeing the empty streets. Okay, and that's surreal also. Anyway, these people who love and care for the city are concerned to make it better. Uh, the way this is done is by having people like yourselves, and by the way, this is actually more than we need. Some of you don't have to follow this every minute. This is actually more than we need. We need a couple of dozen leaders to, mostly of the younger kind, actually, to actually take this through, to take this through. The method that we use is to make you experts. Okay, the idea is not, obviously I'm not gonna be coming back all the time. Peter's gonna be here, but even he has a kind of, uh, uh, has a certain, no, Peter Freeman has, I'm sorry, I thought you were Peter. You look like him. Uh, uh, Peter's gonna be here until he gets tired, you know. He's about 10 or 15 years younger than I am, but he's gonna get tired. But basically it's gonna be a generational thing to move it forward. This requires that you become experts because things continually come up. It's an enormous number of things that come up and you have to understand them perfectly. And you have to understand why it's worthwhile and what the opportunity is. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time actually showing you, uh, uh, making you essentially 
sharing my expertise with you. Now, I myself know quite a few things, but I don't know everything. Peter knows quite a few things, but he doesn't know everything. People like Kennedy Smith know quite a few things, but not everything. And we individually are quite incomplete, but our team is, is quite complete. We assemble the team from all over, having the specialists that are required. Uh, they're flying in and out this week. We have a huge architectural office set up downtown. And as a team, we're experts. But we can't do it without you. And I'm not just saying this because uh, you know, it's a, what's expected. It is actually your personal experience uh, combined with ours. Now, we use a, different, that I, a method that I think is different than most planners. In these public processes, you may have heard or you may have experienced, that what people do is the planner stands up and meeting after meeting taking notes. Well, you, you tell me stuff. This is good, this is bad, we'd like to have this, and I take notes, and I take notes, and I take notes. Then I go home and I spend weeks putting the notes together, and then I send you the report, and then I draw the plan, and I show you the plan, and uh, you may not agree with the plan because it's the first time you saw it, but you saw me taking notes for two weeks, didn't you? And therefore, because I took notes, this must be your plan. But this is not a McDonald's. This is not a, a uh, you don't really get what you order. Okay? You actually get to taste the food. In our charrettes, you get to taste the food before you order. So what we like to do is right from the beginning, as soon as we can, we start drawing and we make propositions. So instead of just taking notes, we have ideas that you can really bite into. You know, you can really get, and then we have plenty of time to correct them and hone them and essentially make them more yours. So it's a different process. Now you might be shocked at how much I want to sh I'm gonna show you today. I absolutely guarantee it that although I've been here twice before, and of course Peter and my partner Tom Lowe from Charlotte has been here quite a few times, we put pencil to paper for the first time last night, and, or uh, mid-afternoon, and then we, we worked late and we worked today. Now, there's a downside to this. I just took this stuff off the tables, directly off the tables, nothing's finished, and much of it is not in order. Okay, so my presentation is such a mess that what I need to do is I need to give you the plot. It's like one of these weird avant-garde movies in which I give you the plot coherently so that you see what the plot is. Then I'll show you the images out of order because there just wasn't any time. I just came out of a meeting. You know, we're always coming out of the meetings. But instead of spending two, three hours getting it ready for you, we spend those two or three hours working. Okay, so that's why it looks like a mess. And in any case, there's no need to be finished. This is the first time you've seen it. This is the first meeting. You know, uh, next Tuesday or Wednesday when we finish, it'll be very finished. And I think you will recognize everything. Okay, so that's why you're seeing this kind of messy thing tonight. But I hope you enjoy the fact that you're really participating. Now, the expert that has to come first, later on the traffic engineers and the landscape and the renderers come, the expert that has to come first is the person who analyzes the economic situation. And Kennedy Smith does two things, so it's a little bit of a hybrid. Uh, she is the person that, she was the head of the National Main Street Program that had over 2,000 main streets that more or less revitalized under her, uh, uh, her care. Uh, in, in, you know, the federal, the, 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 it's, the federal, it's a federal agency, the National Main Street Program from the preservation, uh, What's the, the actual, the, the, the historic, historic trust for, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She's worked on it about 20 years. She was the president for 13 years. She's been consulting for the last 10, okay? And she does two things, as I said. She's gonna give an economic analysis that actually positions this, more or less. It's a little confusing because you're a very distorted place, okay? There's no question about it. These, you know, these, Huge spikes that you have are very distorting. You also have two very cool towns north of here that take a lot of your attention and a lot of your entertainment dollars. That's weird, you know? Uh, and uh, so that'll come up. And then she's going to, because she tracks very closely what is happening in the United States and what's cool and what's next and what, and remember retail is both useful and cool. And she's gonna, be, uh, she's gonna make a shorter presentation uh, of the one she made earlier today, which by the way is videotaped. The full one is videotaped. This is a short one. 
We're all doing little things today. Okay, you remember, you're just doing, you're just doing tastings. And um, she's also going to show you how retail is going to work, how it's beginning to work, and how it has so much to do with the millennials. Now, the millennials are the 20 to 30-year-olds, and the millennials are who we're really working for in this one. Okay, because the millennials, when, when our plan is working on all cylinders, I think it might take 8 to 15 years. Those millennials are 35 and 40. And so one of the things that's peculiar about our trade is my, my timeline is not the next paycheck, it's not the next presentation, it's almost a generation hence. My job as a planner is to look out 15 and 20 years as far as I can. That's the timeline that we work with. It's a very unique field. And in some ways, the present is a distortion field. Whatever's happening now, which you're so expert with, actually, I listen, but it's a distortion field. For example, I'm looking at the Mart, which you just recovered from the last raider from those Las Vegas pirates, right? Okay, I have to worry about that. And it's not about the next five or 10 years. I have to worry whether you're, you're by far highest single source of profitable taxation is going to be here in the long run. And that's a worry that I have. And I want to see what else the city can become so you're not dependent on a single thing like you are now. Now, that's not in your horizon, but it's absolutely on a planner's horizon. I have to see what this university, you know, what the impulse of this university is. One of the things I, I didn't realize, I mean, I realized that this thing is a remarkable, is a remarkable place. And it's, you don't have to be told. Uh, it's physical. You know, you can just see the quality. You can see the, the kids have good manners. I mean, all these miracles that are hard to find. Uh, they stand straight, you know, amazing. Uh, you can see that this is a very special place. What I didn't realize is that until I saw the presentation of uh, Nito Kubain, in which he showed uh, existing, you know, what he inherited and what it became, is that basically everything that you see here that is incredibly, and, and, it's, and everything is virtually everything, because even the old buildings have all been redone, is six years' work. You know, absolutely remarkable. You know, this is like World War II kind of American speed. You know, we haven't seen things happening quickly in this country. And in some ways, I have kind of lowered my expectations. I think, well, it's all going to take 15 years. You know, I know enough about how things happen in this country. It's going to take 15 years. Maybe, just maybe, here it may not take 15 years. You know, maybe I can be convinced because of what happened in this university. It's not only about quality. It's certainly, what we're going to present is certainly not about this ethos of this kind of perfection. Okay, your downtown is not about perfection. It's about something else, as you will see. But maybe, just maybe, if, you, if we really clear, if we really clear the path, you know, and you really understand it, and you really take the risks, it can happen quickly. And that's going to be entirely willpower because I don't think you will be driven to do it by an emergency. It's not as if something's going to happen terrible that is going to cause you to coalesce, you know, behind a project to do it quickly. You're going to have to want to do it because you haven't got a crisis. You just, you're going to want to have to get better, you know, and, and you're going to want to do it quickly. And it's going to be internally driven. So, uh, now... I've already inadvertently introduced Kennedy. <laughs> uh, she's the best at what she does, and she will give this double presentation, which will overlap heavily with mine, and it's the basis, and then we'll move on, and I'll show you what, what we have on our tables. Okay, Mary? You caught me slightly, slightly off guard. Hold on here for a second. This is quite the place. Is this where you have the tiny concerts, or? This is where it's off. This is not plugging in. Matthew? 
Here we go. Got it. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me let me jump right into this. I'm going to just sort of talk about some of those trends that Andres mentioned first, um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that I've observed so far in High Point. In many ways, High Point has kind of followed some of the patterns of uh, lots of American cities um, in its retail development over the years. In the 1940s, 1950s, some things began sort of floating away from the city center, uh, in large part because of the passage of the Interstate Highway Act and a bunch of other things that, that happened around that time, the advent of credit cards, which made it possible for us to, to spend more money than we actually have on retail products and services. And as that all happened, people began moving away from city centers um, to new suburban subdivisions, and as they moved, retail followed them. Retail is, um, is never a market leader, it is always a market follower. It goes where people are and puts itself in their path. It needs to be uh, seen by people, it needs them passing by in order to succeed. And we've had several iterations of new retail formats um, over the past half century. Shopping centers, enclosed shopping malls, regional shopping malls, big box superstores. And as they've grown, what we've basically done is taken a relatively finite supply of retail dollars and spread them out over more and more retail containers, um, um, more and more buildings. So we've, we've, we've kind of you know, built up this, um, this inventory of vacant buildings that have been left in the wake of the new uh, retail venues developing, not just in city centers, but also um, along highway strips as we've lost lots of um, businesses over the years. Um, we've just basically built too much retail stuff, and that's at the core of many of the problems that older downtowns have, including to an extent high points, although you have some unique things. Um, this is an illustration of it. In 1960, we had four square feet of retail space per person in the U.S. We now have 40, a little bit more than 40 square feet per person, so a tenfold increase in space. And you can see that a lot of the development that happened, uh, a lot of the growth that happened occurred um, in the 1990s. Uh, that was the decade of the big box of you know, major big box uh, superstore expansion. Um, we only have enough market demand to support um, about 17 or 18 square feet per person. So we're way, way overbuilt. We have a lot more commercial space than we actually need. Um, the worldwide average is only four square feet per person. China has half a square foot per person. The UK has 12. They have more than any other country in the world. Um, in essence, over the course of a generation or two, we've created a drive-through commercial culture where we do business from our cars um, and have traded out uh, developing these kinds of locally owned businesses with commercial environments like this one, which you can see um, all over the country. Anybody know where this is, by the way? No, yeah. It could be anywhere, but it's not too far north of here in, in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, it used to be that you could come into a community and you could tell by looking at the buildings a lot about the community's evolution. It's materials, it's architectural styles, the names on the buildings would all give you clues to how that community had developed. This is the kind of stuff that you see when you come into a community now. Anybody know what it is? I've, 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 I've taken the name off it. Yeah, and that one? There's a really cool website called It Used to Be a Pizza Hut that you can uh, see all these things. You can tell them right away. Um, the, 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 the actual buildings have become part of corporate branding systems. So we're letting corporations kind of scatter their, their logos um, around the entryways to our communities. We've really lost a lot when we, when we lose that sense of architectural heritage that makes our places unique. One of the forces that makes something, economic forces that make something have value is scarcity or uniqueness. If there's just one of it, it's worth a lot more than if there are a million of it, and we need to get back that sense of unique identity, visual identity for our communities. And that's what kind of brought us all here today. So some of these, these things that are on the horizon for retail, and as I run through these quickly, I want you to think about are you seeing any of these yet in High Point? Are there businesses that you can think of that kind of fit this pattern um, that seem to be on the horizon, on the cusp of reaching forward into the future of how retail is evolving? One of the things is that retail is becoming 24-7. Um, you can shop online for anything from any place in the world um, almost any time of day or night. Um, and that's a good thing because it gives for independently owned businesses, for small businesses, lots of different potential customers that they can reach. Something that High Point already knows about is global markets, and the internet makes it possible for small businesses to also have a global market reach. Global is a piece of that. Businesses that, that serve something, that sell something very specific that you can't get just anywhere. This is a guy in Rising Sun, Indiana, who makes concert harps. Everybody in Rising Sun who needs one kind of has them now. 
Um, so his market is global, uh, and he finds them online. It's also local at the same time, and this is uh, really important to younger people in particular. They want to know where their products come from. They want to be able to know the, the business person um, and have that direct relationship with them. They really like and support locally owned businesses. A lot of retail development, as Andres mentioned earlier, is going to be millennial driven because we are looking five or ten years ahead to what that group, its age cohort, will at that point be um, in the major household formation stages of its life and buying major consumer durables. Millennials happen to love older downtowns. They, they think that they are um, cool places, they're one of a kind, uh, lots of things to explore and learn, um, and they crave that kind of experience. Experience, um, experiential retail, is also an important component of what's emerging. It's making shopping not just about buying things, but making it even more about the experience of being in a special place and finding something special. This is a, an example that I just love. This is a bodega uh, in a neighborhood in Boston, which is you know, a Spanish grocery store. On the outside, it looks like a bodega. On the inside, you can see that it is a bodega. It sells uh, groceries. But in the corner of the store, there's this Snapple juice machine. And if you look carefully on the floor in front of it, you can see that there's this little brass button right there that you step on. And when you do, the Snapple machine door flies open and inside is this men's clothing store, <laughs> which is called Bodega. Um, and it is packed with people. This business is doing uh, sales per square foot that are five, six, seven times um, what, what other men's clothing stores are doing. It's just a phenomenal experience. It has no branding on the outside other than Bodega, but people love, especially millennials, love to find it. They love the experience of seeking it out um, and knowing the secret about opening the Snapple door. Um, retail uh, and, and other independently owned businesses, service businesses, are increasingly becoming crowdsourced. People in a community are kind of suggesting their ideas, throwing them out there, and by getting feedback from others, are as a group shaping uh, what, what the retail composition of a district might be. This is a, um, an example from, from um, uh, Alaska. This is in um, uh, Fairbanks. It's an old uh, hotel building called the Polaris building that had become vacant. And they brought in an artist who sort of branded the process of finding a new use for the building, looking for love again uh, for this building. And what she did was she put these blackboards on the ground floor sort of prime corner. One blackboard on one side, one corner, says, uh, ask people to write down their memories of the Polaris building, and on the other side it asked them to write down their hopes for the Polaris building. And by going out every day and photographing these and seeing people respond to other people's messages over the course of a couple of weeks, the community came to consensus about how they would like the Polaris building to be reused. Um, and they also kind of built their own, their own customer base for it because these people who contributed ideas now really wanted to support and be customers of uh, the businesses that were there. And that same process has been happening here through the Ignite High Point process. Um, Wendy has gotten back, I don't know, several hundred cards uh, from people suggesting ideas for things they'd like to see um, in, in the core city in, in High Point. Um, we're going to see more businesses be locally capitalized, especially businesses that are a high priority to the community, um, businesses people really want to see succeed. Um, and there are websites now like Kickstarter and Indiegogo that are using crowdfunding um, uh, pretty frequently. This is a, um, a bakery in California called Sweet Bar that was capitalized. It got its startup capital completely um, online. Uh, they had a goal of raising $20,000. They raised $21,000 uh, in record time by selling things like the naming rights to muffins they were going to be selling in the store. Um, you could, for a thousand bucks, you could name the the, uh, the cappuccino maker. Um, retail is is increasingly more nimble, um, responding to uh, changes in customer demand, going where customers are, not not it, not accepting that the the retail base is here, but really taking it out further. This is a uh, a mobile yarn shop. Uh, they're the women who own it. It's going to be connected, um, tied into social media. This is a clothing store. It sells sort of upper end leather jackets. And you'll see that the hangers that they're on have a number on them. Those are the number of likes that each of those garments has gotten on Facebook. Um, and it's just wired uh, directly to the hangers. It's going to be environmentally friendly. And this has some implications for, uh, for how people are going to shop because younger people, millennials, are, are spending are spending as much money as their parents, but they're buying fewer things. They're buying things that last longer um, and that aren't as expendable. This is a company that makes uh, men's clothing that's meant to last for several generations. So you can see that inside this jacket, there's a tag. Um, and on the tag, there's a blank for the first owner to write his name and the date he acquired it, then for the second owner to write his name and the date he acquired it, um, and so on. It's meant to last. Well, they've got four, four blanks in there, so you know, presumably through 
uh, four different owners. It's going to be ubiquitous. We're going to see businesses reaching to find customers in many different places. Millennials, you know, there's really no transition for them between shopping in a bricks and mortar store, shopping online, uh, shopping on a street corner. To them, there's sort of a continuum of experience. Um, and so retailers need to get in front of that. We're gonna see more and more retailers using things like vending machines. This is um, Redbox, which as you all know, rents videos. They're now beginning to experiment with little grocery vending machines. Um, this is an experiment that Tesco did in Korea where they, they basically made replicas, photo replicas of their grocery shelves, convenient shelves, put them in a subway station in Seoul, and when you were uh, waiting for your train in the morning, you could scan items on the shelves, um, put in your order, send it to Tesco, tell them what train you're going to be on in the evening, and your groceries are there waiting for you. Um, it's going to be more interactive, and this is not only going to be in the retail store itself, but also out on the streets, and I'm seeing this all over the country right now. Things like geotagging, where people are, are tagging places that are significant to them and recording stories about it. Um, interactive window displays. This could be something that could work in some of the, uh, some, some parts of the market district where you have storefronts that appear to be dead. Uh, this is actually a very shallow video projection on the inside of a, of a vacant storefront window. Um, and it's, an, it's a, 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 a video artist who recorded this acrobat uh, doing different leaps, but it responds to a heat sensor on the outside of the window so that whoever is walking by can make this, this, this performer appear to perform. Um, stops people dead in their tracks. They just stand there and kind of transfix to see what's going on. Um, and it happens relatively easily. The guy records this against a, a green screen. There's the camera set up. Um, the point is getting activity in the windows is a key to keeping people entertained on the streets and getting uh, shoppers engaged. Um, this is a community that put a bunch of rocking chairs out. Here's one that put some bronze dance steps with directional arrows on the sidewalk so that as you walk along, you suddenly do a little dance step. There's a poem. There's a crosswalk painted as a, a piano keyboard. Uh, these are uh, um, electric traffic switching boxes in uh, downtown Nashville where they have speakers built in so as you walk past, it plays a little blast of music recorded by a Nashville artist. Um, interactivity is going to be an important piece. So what about High Point? I've been doing some number crunching before I got here to understand uh, what's happening here and to give some insight into the design team as we head into the charrette. And basically, these are the kinds of things that I've been looking at. I've been looking at demographic characteristics. What is it about the demographics of people here with, that might influence uh, the kinds of things there's a market for, a growing market for, what kinds of things might there not be a market for. I've done inventories of uh, sort of sub-districts uh, throughout the core city. Um, to see what kinds of businesses are there, how are they distributed, how many workers does each one have. I've looked at retail demand for the overall city, uh, how much the community is expected to grow over time, the sub-districts, uh, residents of the adjacent census tracts. I'll show you this in a little bit more detail in a second. Visitors who come here for market or for other kinds of things, people driving through. Um, and finally, commercial rents and sales prices. Um, just to give you sort of a, 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 a potpourri, a little slice of this, this is... Um, this is the eye, eye test section of the evening. Um, just joking. This is, a, this is sort of a quick analysis for the overall city of retail um, uh, leakages and surpluses. And what this means is uh, here are retail categories. It's actually store categories. Uh, this is the supply, which means this is how much businesses in High Point are actually capturing in sales on an annual basis. Demand is how much money people who live in High Point are spending on products and services someplace, not necessarily here. That could be going outside the community. Um, and then the gap is whether there's a, a surplus, meaning that you're bringing in more sales uh, than you're losing, or a, 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 um, a leakage, meaning that you're, you're losing sales to someplace else. On whole, it looks like you've got a sales surplus. It's down here behind me, 383 million bucks. But I actually think it's not true, and here are the reasons why I've discovered that. Um, some things are sort of anomalous when you think about who's buying things. Uh, big surplus in uh, automotive sales, where could that be coming from? Sales of Bentleys, maybe? I mean, you've got some pretty remarkable businesses here. <laughs> Same thing with, with furniture and home furnishings. Why would High Point have a significant sales surplus in that category? Um, I can't begin to guess. Health and personal uh, care stores, well, you have a hospital. Um, you know, you've got your kind of a major center of health care. Um, and then finally down here, food services and drinking places. It looks like you've got a $14 million surplus. Guess what? People who are here during market, those two weeks a year, the 75,000 people, they alone are spending about $20 million on, on eating out. 
um, so that surplus goes away. I actually think that you've got a sales shortfall overall when you add up all the categories, and entertainment isn't included in here, um, of probably about 200 to 250 million dollars which is not necessarily bad news. It actually means that you've got opportunities to create some pretty cool new businesses um, and recapture some of those sales, in addition to continuing to build on the surpluses that you're gaining from drawing in people for specialized shopping from other places. Um, animation's gone nuts. I also took a look at how the population is expected to grow over time, and just looking at between 2012 and 2020, um, in that period of time, the population growth that you get in current year dollars, 2013 dollars, um, will, will mean that there's about $72 million more in sales demand from people who live in High Point than you have right now. Again, an opportunity uh, to uh, capture some new sales. Um, let me talk about the different districts here for a second. This is uh, the, the Core City map, um, as you all know from the Core City plan, and this is the area um, that the team is focusing on. Basically, um, there is the, uh, um, the market districts which kind of splay there. Let me go back for a second and show you that better. Uh, the market districts are in dark purple. The pink is the, the, um, the downtown mixed use district. Um, blue is the medical area. Then there's a mixed use uh, corridor that, that feeds into um, uptown and then uh, over here uh, into the university area. The team is focusing, like I said, on, um, on pretty much all of this with the exception of a piece of the medical district. From my work, it doesn't matter. Um, retail dollars are sort of like air. They kind of all flow into the area anyway. So I've been looking at the, dif at the, at the different um, districts uh, one at a time. This is the, um, uh, the downtown mixed-use district kind of between the two pieces of the market district. Uh, and, and looking at it, what I found, among other things, are that there are 154 businesses there, 990 people work there on a daily basis, and those 990 people, th their households spend about $5.9 million a year on products and services someplace. That's the market demand available in that district, just from the people who are there, mostly from 9 to 5 every day, uh, a great captive market. Um, the major uses there, uh, surprisingly, healthcare is the major use, kind of bleeding over from the medical district. Um, retail trade, only 6.7%. That's a pretty, pretty low, low number. Um, and dining in hotels and arts and entertainment, even lower, only about 1% each in terms of use. So obviously, a lot of room for retail growth and improvement um, there in the, mid, in, in the mixed use area. The medical area, 275 business entities almost 5,000 people working there on a daily basis. That's like having a small town plopped down in the middle of downtown High Point. Huge, huge potential market. Um, those households that they represent are spending about you know, $29 million a year on stuff. Um, not surprisingly, the major business uses there are, are, uh, are healthcare. Um, dining in hotels, less than 1%. Think of all those workers and all the visitors to the hospital um, who don't have convenient places um, to eat there. Retail trade, only 4%. Uptown is looking a little bit more uh, healthy and more like a traditional downtown in terms of its business composition. 355 businesses there, 1,730 staff, uh, generating retail demand of about $10.5 million themselves. Um, and major uses there, retail accounts for about 16% of what we see, um, and so on down the list. Dining in hotels, tiny bit low at 6.8%. Um, the corridor from Lexington to uh, the university um, here um, is relatively